My intention is to conduct an approach. Small boat inspection team, close up. Potential for danger is always there. We're always training just to make sure that we're all prepared for anything that might happen to us. Small boat approaching my starboard bow. If you do not turn away immediately, I will be forced to defend myself. Threat bearing green 3-0, engage! A powerful naval task group has sailed east from home ports in Canada to one of the most lawless maritime regions in the world, the Persian Gulf. Now in command of Combined Task Force 150, its mission is to lead an international coalition of warships in the fight against maritime terrorism and piracy using whatever means necessary. Deployed to this dangerous theater of operations on active duty for four months, these are the men and women who make up the crew of Her Majesty's Canadian ships Iroquois. Walk in, guys! Calgary. And Protector. HMCS Calgary is a helicopter carrying guided missile patrol frigate. She's equipped with anti-submarine, anti-surface, and anti-air warfare weapons, sensors, and defenses. Combined with state-of-the-art damage control and machinery control systems, this frigate is one of the most advanced warship designs in the world. Commander Kelly Larkin is the commanding officer of HMCS Calgary. Calgary is a uh, major warship. Simply put, if we didn't have a warship this size, with this kind of uh, capability and the, the full range of capabilities, we wouldn't be able to influence the outcome of events in this region the way we do. Calgary is a powerful weapon in CTF 150's arsenal in the fight against maritime terrorism in this dangerous region of the planet. She is capable of protecting not only herself, but other coalition warships if need be. From a defensive point of view of both this ship and other ships in our vicinity, uh, we have uh, anti-aircraft missiles, uh, a very sophisticated point defense missile, the Evolve Sea Sparrow missile. The Sea Sparrow missiles are vertically launched from deck-mounted canisters located amid ships. Rising four meters in the air before beginning its trajectory towards the target, the missile has a speed of Mach 2.5 and a range of nearly 17 kilometers. Her 850 caliber machine guns, capable of firing 550 rounds per minute, are tactically located around the ship and are used for air and surface engagements. One of her most intimidating weapons is ideally suited for work in this theater of operations. The Bofors SAK 57mm gun, capable of firing up to 220 shots per minute. We've got the, the ship's gun, 57mm, uh, which is uh, it's primarily an air defense weapon, but uh, can also be used in the surface mode. And if, for example, we were conducting, a, we were intending to conduct a boarding on a vessel, uh, if necessary, we, uh, we may conduct warning shots to uh, indicate to that vessel that. Uh, we mean business, and uh, it's important that they heave to and receive our boarding party. The combined task force mandate of ensuring maritime security in this region involves far more than simply maintaining an imposing presence. Calgary's naval boarding party has the right by international law to board and inspect the cargo of any vessel. Lieutenant Commander Arvinder Aujla is HMCS Calgary's executive officer. Calgary's role out here is to patrol. Um, 
We do what Task Force 150 tells us to do. That might be to guard a body of water. It might be to um, conduct a patrol through a body of water. And what it is is that we uh, seek uh, out uh, vessels uh, who are doing international trade, legitimate, that's fine. Uh, if it's not legitimate, and if it can be tied to an aspect of terrorism, we may go over there and question what they're doing. Our primary mission here is counter-terrorism. So we are conducting our patrol, and currently we're here in the North Arabian Sea, very close to the coast of Iran, uh, because that is where a lot of the, uh, the smuggling activity originates, between Pakistan and Iran. And uh, if if these uh, smuggling activities are taking place in support of terrorism, we are very much interested in uh, preventing that sort of activity from taking place. Today, HMCS Calgary has received orders to take a closer look at some fishing vessels in the area. But sailing so close to the waters of an unfriendly country adds an extra complication to the operation. The vessels that we were looking at uh, there were a, a small group of five of them with one larger one uh, which looked like a mothership for uh, four other uh, fishing dows. They were just outside of Iranian territorial waters which raises the pucker factor a little bit because uh, obviously the operations that we conduct we do in international waters and we don't want to uh, in any way impede the, uh, the, uh, the state. So uh, notwithstanding the fact that it was Iran and uh, close to an Iranian naval base uh, because they would likely take an interest in a, in a coalition warship, um, we, we wanted to approach these vessels because we didn't have information about them and we wanted to help them understand why it is that we're here and to see if they had observed anything unusual in the area. Before the boarding party team makes its approach, the vessel of interest must be hailed by a radio. So there's a, there's a vessel out there in international waters, legitimate or illegitimate, we don't know yet. But what we do is establish comms with that vessel. If we can speak to them in their language, they're already at comfort. So that skill is very important. Once we've established communications with them, we ask them if we can come over and visit and just talk to them. Fishing vessel in position 25 degrees, 02 decimal 7 minutes north. 60 degrees, 15 decimal 2 minutes east. This is Coalition Warship 335, Omni Channel 16, over. And this is uh, port control. Try again. Fishing vessel in position 25 degrees. The first hail in English results in a response from a local port, but radio silence from the vessel of interest. So we're switching uh, different languages. We started the uh, hail in English to see if we'd get a response. Now we're switching over to uh, Arabic. And if we don't have any uh, success with Arabic, then we'll switch over and try uh, Farsi and Urdu and Hindi and uh, see if he replies that way. A local linguist traveling with Calgary, fluent in Arabic and Urdu, is brought to the bridge to attempt to make contact with the lead dhow of the small fishing fleet. With no response in the three languages commonly used in the area, it's possible the Dow's crew is intimidated by the warship and afraid to respond, but it could also be an indication of more sinister activity. Commander Larkin now calls for the boarding party team to prepare for the approach operation. Small boat inspection team, this is from close up. Starboard watch boarding stations, starboard watch boarding stations. Small boat inspection team, close up. Calgary's naval boarding party quickly closes up and prepares to leave the mothership. 
In the bridge, the XO is still attempting to establish communication with the Dow before resorting to more drastic measures. Also, why speed too? The operations room officer of the watch has been observing the Dow and now reports his findings to the CO. Commander Larkin must make his decision to proceed or not. Uh, basically, the uh, contact of interest right now is off our uh, bow. Uh, we've tracked him from a distance, uh, tracked him solidly throughout. He's been making basically a stationary position uh, amongst a group of Dow suspected to fishing grounds. Based on the, uh, the positioning of the, uh, the contact and the fact that it's sufficient to assess he's a good candidate for uh, getting local knowledge and that kind of thing, a good candidate for approach offs, um, our ROE for this is uh, sufficient for self defense. Main concern here, sir, is the uh, nearness to territorial waters. Yes. Uh, we're maintaining our two nautical miles, uh, all sensor search uh, focusing on the northwest. Northeast. Northeast, yeah. yeah. Uh, nothing further. Okay. Intelligence? Uh, there's no intelligence uh, indicating any specific Great. on these uh, lines. Okay, uh, boarding officer and for uh, your team in the boat, my intention is to get a little bit closer to the uh, the, the uh, mother ship of this uh, five Dow small fishing fleet, uh, watching very, very carefully for nets so that we don't uh, interfere with anything that they're doing here. Uh, and if we do, I'll turn away, okay? Uh, but my intention is to conduct an approach, okay? As you get closer to the Dow, watch for any signs of hostility towards our presence, uh, any concern about the approach of the boat, because I don't want to damage any of their equipment, okay? We're trying to build rapport with these people and encourage an exchange of information for security purposes, all right? The boarding party is a highly specialized group of trained personnel. They're proficient in small arms firing and have acclimatized to the extreme temperatures in the region. Grenade round magazine, load, be ready. Even so, in today's 40 degree weather, the team will attempt to change out every hour or so, and the next shift stands at the ready. MP5 with a 30 round magazine, load. Despite their enthusiasm, not every member has participated in an actual boarding within the theater of operations. Months of drills and exercises will now be put to the test. Okay, pull in. Start hydrating now. Are you declaring an emergency, sir? Watch all episodes of Ice Pilot. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Download Beely now. MP5s with a 30 round magazine. Load. HMCS Calgary is a state of the art patrol frigate. Here in the waters just south of Iran, she's a formidable naval presence, supporting Combined Task Force 150 in its mission to bring maritime security to the region. The naval boarding party has closed up, readying to conduct an approach operation on the lead dow of a fleet of fishing boats drifting just outside Iranian territorial waters. Sub-Lieutenant Dan Kim is Calgary's boarding party team leader, or Alpha One. Potential for danger is always there. Um, and um, we're always training just to make sure that we're all prepared for anything that might happen to us. Come left. Third hydrating now. As per Navy protocol, the boarding party waits for its final instructions from the commanding officer. CO Larkin has encountered an unexpected complication that could potentially endanger the team during the approach off. Calgary is sailing near the edge of an unfriendly country's territory and is facing the possibility of leaving international waters. Boarding party, attention! Stand at ease. Okay, team, can everyone hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right, here's the situation. We are about 1.8 miles outside of Iranian territorial waters. We've got a small fishing fleet of about five fishermen, including one mother vessel, and uh, my initial intention was to conduct an approach job on the mothership. 
problem is all of us are being set towards Iranian territorial waters at about a half to three quarters of a knot. Okay, and with, uh, with us being just 1.5 miles outside of territorial waters, I can't take the chance that you're going to be over there or perhaps even invited on board by the master and then with the uh, risk of being set into Iranian territorial waters. So I'm going to suspend this approach off. All right. Uh, sorry to uh, bring you up to this point and then have to call it off, but uh, we're simply too close to territorial waters. Good dress rehearsal, but uh, we'll get a chance. All right. Thank you. Alpha wave on the guardrail. MP5s unload, prepare for inspection. We conducted the uh, the preparations for the approach, and as I watched how the the fleet of five vessels was being set by the ocean currents, it, after a few minutes, it became obvious that because they were just two miles outside of Iranian territorial waters and being set to the northeast that within about uh, half an hour to 45 minutes, depending on the rate, uh, we'd have been set uh, inside Iranian territorial waters, which uh, clearly I, I couldn't run that risk. So uh, we got right up to the final stages of briefing the boarding party on the rules of engagement, uh, which is all standard practice whenever we send the team away. And, uh, and then I had to call it off because it was just gonna be too close. It is impossible to predict what a boarding party will find during an approach op or how the operation will end. The Iranian Navy ambushed and captured a Royal Navy boarding party in 2007. While the incident ended safely, the international coalition is not willing to risk a similar experience. Although willing to leave the safety of the mothership, Calgary's boarding party members follow the CO's commands and begin to disperse. All right, just now, let's head back down, get the weapons secured, and uh, go back to the daily routine. There. HMCS Calgary is now south of Iran, just outside of Iranian territorial waters. Smuggling and piracy are common in this high traffic area of the theater of operations. The ship's company is on high alert, gathering intelligence and establishing a recognized maritime picture. Calgary is ideally suited for investigating vessels of interest. Her engine power and precise handling have earned her the nickname Ferrari of the Fleet. These ships are incredibly maneuverable, lots of power, and uh, you know when you consider the kinds of things that we could find ourselves involved with, you need that kind of capability. Uh, the ship is, is fast, uh, they'll do over 30 knots, uh, a lot of power, they'll, uh, they'll turn quickly, they'll accelerate and decelerate quickly. Uh, you can get yourself both into trouble and out of trouble real, real quick. Both engines, full speed ahead, set, sir. Very good. Now, the launch captain, conductor Williamson, turn to starboard. Aye, sir. Starboard 30. Practicing the tools and skills for war at sea is one thing, but being able to call upon this knowledge in the heat of battle is quite another. Even in this potential hotspot, the daily drilling that is part of life on a warship continues. Warfare fighting skills or seamanship skills are no different than many other occupations. The skills are perishable. The minute you rest, whether you're a professional athlete or a professional musician or a stock trader, once you stop doing your trade, that's when you become vulnerable. So that's why it's important for us to keep at the, uh, the pointy end. Today, members of the combat department will be conducting a reactions procedures drill, testing the crew's response times to attack from small, fast-moving boats. These go-fasts, as they're known, could be laden with explosives and their crews hell-bent on a suicide mission. Skillfully combining aggressive handling of the ship with the firing of 50 cows creates a one-two punch that could save the frigate and the 240 lives on board. Sub-Lieutenant Jeff Pye is the weapons officer. His training is conducted under the watchful eye of Commander Kelly Larkin. Starboard 10. Starboard 10. All positions, Captain. Possible threat, small boat, bearing green 5. Issue warning 1. Left 290. Steer 290. Steer 290.
sailboat on my starboard bow. This is Coalition Warship 335. You are approaching my security zone and your intentions are not known. Turn away immediately. The right 293. There, 293. There, 293. Issue warning two. Now we're shooting one and two. It's not entirely unusual for a DAO in this part of the world to try to ignore a first request for communication from a coalition warship. Sometimes this is simply due to not understanding the language of the hail. When a second warning is disregarded, though, it could be an indication of suspicious activity, particularly with a 4,000-ton frigate bearing down on a much smaller vessel. Issue warning three. Small boat approaching my starboard bow. This is Coalition Warship 335. If you do not turn away immediately, I will be forced to defend myself. This is your final warning. W.E.L. Captain. W.E.L. Sir. Red Green 201 warning shots, fire. W.E.L. GP1, bearing Green 20, warning shots, fire. Cease fire, cease fire, cease fire. Threat bearing green three zero engage. GP one, GP three, threat bearing green three zero engage. Green three zero engage. Jump three. Cease fire. All positions, cease fire, cease fire, cease fire. The safety of the crew and the ship is dependent to a large extent upon teamwork on the bridge. The drill has uncovered an opportunity for the weapons officer to learn a valuable lesson, one delivered personally by the CO. You don't stop firing until I say cease fire. Yes, sir. All right. Not just a burst and then stop. All right. Yes, sir. Okay. So we're going to reset. Sub-Lieutenant Jeff Pye gets a second chance as the combat department prepares for a second drill. GP-1, threat bearing green, 2-0, warning shots, fire! Cease, cease fire! All positions, threat bearing green, 5-0, engage! GP-1 out of ammo. Cease fire! The reactions procedures drill wraps up, allowing members of the combat department to reflect on their performance. Battle drills that closely resemble potential situations are a crucial aspect of naval training, particularly in this dangerous theater of operations. It's not unrealistic to expect that the ship's company would find itself in volatile circumstances at practically any minute. As a frigate, HMCS Calgary is nimble. Her maneuverability is due to a relatively small size. While near perfect as a weapon of war, she is less than ideal in terms of home comforts. Squeezing 240 men and women into a space that is 440 feet long by 52 feet across at her widest is an exercise in complex logistics. Calgary's executive officer and chief petty officer see it all on their daily rounds of the ship. Okay, so we're going to 7S? 7S it is, XO. Alrighty. 7S, located on 3-deck near Calgary's bow, is home to a dozen sailors. So what we have here is just a, a typical mess uh, on uh, Calgary. What it is is uh, about how many people are in here, please? 12 people. 12 people uh, reside in this space here. And I guess the biggest thing about a warship is uh, yourself or personal space is uh, very limited. And so this is where they come when they're not uh, doing their jobs or eating. And we've got a little set tea area here where the guys may have a TV, video games, be able to read. And uh, other than that, the other thing that's uh, uh, important to note is just the amount of space that people have to keep their stuff. All right, so what we do on a long deployment is, um, you know, get some extra little containers for guys to put their personal amenities in. Uh, just try to make it as comfortable as we can for the, uh, the six-month deployment. 
Every member of the ship's company has access to the wardroom according to their rank. In the past, the higher the rank, the better the wardroom, but today they all compare well with each other. Located on three deck, the Corvette Club is the sailor's wardroom. Compared with the sailor's cramped sleeping quarters and lack of personal space, this messy is popular. It provides a place to relax and speak freely, away from the scrutiny of the ship's officers. Okay, so what we got here is the, uh, the master seaman and below mess of uh, HMCS Calgary. This is where uh, the equivalent of the wardroom for the officers and the uh, corral for the uh, chief and POs. But when they're not on watch, uh, they can come down here and uh, hang out, watch movies, uh, play video games, and obviously this is where they also uh, take their meals. Located on three deck amidships is the corral, the chief and petty officers mess. So this is where the uh, chief and petty officers uh, hang out when they're not on watch, very similar to the uh, wardrobe for the officers and the, uh, the Corvette Club for the master men and below. So again, uh, the setup is they can take meals on one side of it and then they can draw the curtain and watch uh, movies and uh, play video games. Probably two of our most experts at the video games are right here, Chief Hallman and Chief Slater. It's very surprising that they're actually here because normally they work so hard uh, that you wouldn't find them in here. After you've done your uh, work for the day, you can come down here and try to get some normalcy, just like what everybody else does at, at home. Come after work, have some supper, maybe watch TV for a little bit before you go to bed, and uh, that's what's done here. As the ship's executive officer, second in command only to the ship's commanding officer, Lieutenant Commander Ausla has earned the privilege of a private cabin. Okay, next we'll go into uh, my cabin. And this is uh, similar to uh, most of the officer cabins. Uh, and this space here is uh, only myself, but I use it as both my uh, living space and my office, unlike uh, the coxswain, who has his own office and a much larger cabin. Not that I'm bitter or anything, um, but you know, I do a lot more work than the coxswain does, but that's okay. So uh, basically a desk, uh, lots of uh, storage space in and around. This uh, flips down and uh, becomes your uh, bunk and this is where uh, I sleep and uh, you know I didn't bad mouth the coxswain but he did get me a TV installed and there's a CD player or sorry a DVD player as well so not too bad uh, again um, the, the theme there is the space on, on, on the ship is limited uh, here I'm, I'm very fortunate actually to have a lot of storage space and this is where I come to have my uh, alone time but uh, the policy that I have is uh, and my door is always open uh, for anybody on the crew uh, if they have any kind of concerns. 24-7, uh, knock on the door and we'll go from there. One of the things you'll notice is that uh, some of the lights are off and then what we do that is uh, so that it instills uh, into people the need to keep the ship cool. So the temperatures outside being anywhere from about 35 to uh, 45 degrees uh, Celsius, what it does is uh, just remind people to sort of keep the lights off and keep the doors and hatches leading to the upper deck uh, closed. Creating a positive atmosphere on board is important. The food, of course, plays a big part in that. Out here, a simple meal is something to look forward to. The galley is located on three deck. So what we have here is the, uh, the galley for uh, Calgary. Uh, obviously all the meals are prepared here for the 240 people that we have on board. At least three meals a day, uh, normally a fourth meal. And uh, so this is where the guys come on the steam line, uh, pick up their uh, food. But uh, this is where all the food is prepared and laid out. Along with all the, uh, the, the meals, there's also the, the desserts, the bread, the bakery. Uh, that's this section right here. Oh wow, look at that. Members of the logistics department are trained in skills that can be used in the Army, Air Force, or Navy. For these folks, flexibility is everything. Just posted to HMCS Calgary, Sergeant Joanne Stevens is a member of the logistics department and one of the ship's seven cooks. I was Army for a while, but always base. This is my first Navy posting. Um, I actually like the Navy better than I like the Army. 
probably get shot for saying that, but <laughs> um, so far, yeah, it's not going too bad. Um, apart from being seasick when it, the waves get kind of rough, other than that, it's not too bad. Work-wise, yes, we put in a lot of long hours. Being a Navy cook, many long hours are spent in the galley. Um, but I like the hands-on, being the rank that I am, a sergeant normally is doing paperwork. I like the fact that I can come in here and prepare salads and have a little bit more of a hands-on. A lot of the challenges are you have to brace yourself when you're working. You have to make sure everything is secure. If you leave a pot just laying around on the counter like this, you're going to lose it because it's going to fly off. Working, living and eating on board a fighting ship can create a physically inactive lifestyle for some sailors. Tucking exercise equipment into the frigate's few unused corners is one way to encourage physical fitness on a long deployment. Space is at a premium. And so what we, we do is we put the, the physical equipment whenever we can, wherever we can, uh, bicycles, uh, treadmills, uh, weights, uh, so that the crew has regular access to gym equipment and can stay uh, fit. Up working on the upper decks is also very popular. On Calgary, we, ran, we run a sports period uh, once a day, and we got a large majority of the ship's company participating in that. But uh, the cops in, the, in a lot of the ship's company, every day use a sign-up sheet, and it's a good way to uh, stay in shape uh, um, you know, while we're deployed. HMCS Calgary is navigated and steered from her bridge. The CO commands the frigate from here, with its unobstructed views high above the water. Okay, where we are uh, right now is on the uh, bridge of HMCS Calgary, and in most basic terms, this is where the ship is driven from. Now, the captain isn't always on the bridge, uh, so he has his representative, which is uh, currently the officer of the watch, who is uh, Lieutenant Mitchell, who is also our navigating officer. So he uh, executes the ship's program, uh, which is getting the ship from point A to point B. He has a team that helps him out. He's got a second officer of the watch, which is uh, uh, Sub-Lieutenant Turner there and between the two of them they're responsible for the, the navigation and the safe uh, keeping of the ship. Assisting them over there is the helmsman and the throttleman and uh, we'll go take a closer look and uh, see how they do their job. Now you have this vision of a big wheel uh, on a ship uh, but actually the, the wheel of, of uh, the frigate is uh, just this uh, small little uh, a helm and uh, the officer of the watch and the second officer of the watch, uh, they give him a course to steer and he controls uh, the, uh, the helm to achieve the desired course. So either turning the steering wheel to the left or to the right and steadying it up on a course. Along with the steering portion of it, you also have the propulsion portion of it. Uh, it's two gas turbines, uh, which is what you would find on a, a DC-10. It's a marine version of that, so imagine um, your ship with uh, two aircraft engines and uh, the officer of the watch, the second officer of the watch, will uh, uh, say what speed they require and it's just a matter of uh, uh, pushing these uh, joysticks and then the uh, engineering officer of the watch uh, makes the plant uh, respond to that order and uh, we can go anywhere from uh, uh, full speed astern to full speed ahead which equates approximately to 15 knots astern to about 30 knots ahead. During times of peace, HMCS Calgary is often deployed on training and search and rescue missions. But with her heavy armament and intimidating countermeasures, she's more than capable of putting up a good fight. On this deployment, Calgary's on the front lines with Combined Task Force 150 patrolling the volatile waters of the Persian Gulf and areas beyond. While extensive weaponry suitable for surface-to-air, surface-to-surface, and anti-submarine combat, her big guns are excessive when approaching local dows for information. Requesting the crews of vessels of interest to share their maritime knowledge of the region requires a gentler touch. In this theater of operations, with its almost daily boarding parties, small arms are the weapons of choice for defense. Leading seaman Mark Purvis is responsible for those firearms. I am the small arms keeper on board, and uh, primarily my job is to uh, maintain the weapons on board and make sure that they're always locked up here. Uh, where you, you can see you have an assortment of weapons here. You have the 9mm Sig Sauer, 
Uh, right here you have the MP5, primarily used by the boarding party. In this cabinet here, you have the shotgun, primarily used by the boarding party. And you also have the C7 in the opposite ca cabinet over here. Your biggest guns are the 50 cal right here. As you can see, it's physically bigger. Um, the rounds are much bigger as well. This is a dummy round right here. This is the size of a 50 cal round. Okay. Um, six hours, nine millimeter. Small, much smaller rounds. Shotguns, you know, it's about, uh, we use a slug on board, so about that size. Makes a nice hole. Um, shotgun is actually very powerful. Uh, as well as the C9, takes 5.56 millimeter, but it's rapid fire. That's a very powerful weapon. As well as the MP5, not quite as fast, but uh, it's good for cover fire. As the naval weapons technician with the Combat Systems Engineering Department, leading Seaman Purvis is responsible for the maintenance of the small arms and ammunition. All the rounds are accounted for, all the weapons are accounted for but they, they have to be kept locked up. If there was ever a round to be fired off accidentally, it has to be, uh, has to be logged, and uh, everything is accounted for. Leading Seaman Purvis will be supplying the firearms for today's weapons drill on the flight deck. Calgary is scheduled to enter the port of Muscat in Oman on the south side of the Gulf of Oman. A specially trained team will remain on board to guard the frigate. The training this afternoon will be for the Force Protection Watch. As we come alongside into uh, Muscat, uh, we need to have our uh, upper deck sentries and our access point sentries. So before we go into a port, we like to have them shoot, make sure that they're uh, fami still familiar with the weapon. It's an ongoing familiarity with the weapon that we're we're trying to instill here, weapon proficiency. The force protection team loads the C7 magazines with 5.56 millimeter bullets. Known for its reliability, the C-7's accuracy and versatility make it a good all-round weapon for a variety of tactical situations. Hey, make sure you wait until you're clear by range staff before you try to fire the weapon. Clear! Once you're clear, let the action go forward. Hey, try to fire the weapon and then put the weapon down on deck. A brief port visit will be a welcome change of scenery for many of the sailors on board, but being alongside in most Persian Gulf ports means exposing HMCS Calgary and her crew to the very real possibility of a terrorist attack from land. Training in the hot temperatures and extreme levels of humidity in the region, the force protection team is asked to be capable of responding to many threat scenarios. You're the access point sentry. <clears throat> okay, beautiful sunny afternoon. We're parked downtown in the tourist area, lots of people walking back and forth, okay? A man comes up to you, speaks very good English, he you know, starts just chatting with you. You know, he has relatives who live in Vancouver, okay? So you know, you're being nice and polite, giving him information about the ship. All of a sudden you see something that doesn't look quite right. He's wearing a long trench coat on a hot day like this. You know, he keeps on talking to you. All of a sudden, he unbuttons the trench coat, you see send six of dynamite wrapped around him, reaches into a pocket, pulls out a remote detonator. What do you do? After 10 rounds have been discharged, each C7 is inspected, then pointed safely out to sea and dry fired or proven to ensure the chamber is empty. This helps to avoid any accidental discharges. While alongside in a country with a potentially unfriendly population, terrorists posing as regular civilians can target coalition warships and their crew. Strict military security can keep local people and the ship's company safe from terrorist attacks, particularly in crowded areas. With the firebrand magazine, low, access, spec, sir, don't cost the weapon. Starts running towards the crowd, he's got his hand in his pocket. What would you do? Okay, <clears throat> pulls out his hand, 
He pulled his hand out of his pocket. He's got a knife in his hand. What would you do? Excellent. Okay. You see him lunge towards one of your shipmates, trying to stab him. What would you do? The C-7 can be fired in either semi-automatic or automatic mode and is capable of firing 700 to 800 rounds per minute. Remember guys, let everybody else on the ship know there's a man here standing on the gun. What would you do? Security alert, security alert, right? The training continues into the heat of the afternoon. Regular drilling of the force protection team keeps skills and reaction time sharp. Faced with a real-life situation, these sailors must be able to instinctively fall back on their training, a life-saving skill in the face of danger. Call the port watch. Call the port watch. Hands to breakfast. Morning, Calgary Operations Officer, with a quick sit rep for today. Uh, we find ourselves uh, 50 nautical miles uh, south of uh, Pakistan, uh, continuing our search for any illicit activity in the area. Uh, today is a very uh, busy day, so make sure you take a good look at the uh, flex and uh, are familiar with it. 240 men and women live and work aboard HMCS Calgary in support of the International Coalition of Warships. Along with managing the stress of this long and potentially dangerous deployment are the trials of working two long shifts a day, seven days a week. Chief Petty Officer First Class Mike McCallum is Calgary's coxswain. A lot of the guys on, on board are uh, standing what we call one and two watch rotation. Whether they're on watch for uh, five hours at one time, off for five hours, back on again for seven, then off for seven. And then in between their off time, they're eating, uh, working out. So really, you're getting maybe about eight hours off per day at any one given time. Uh, it's a pretty busy lifestyle. And then if there's emergencies in between, it could be a whole ship function that uh, everybody has to turn to for. Imagine living and working in your office cubicle for several weeks at a time without leaving the building or seeing your family. From the youngest sailors to the most experienced, the most fundamental of bonds is the challenge of being half a world away from the comforts of home and loved ones. Homesickness is simply a reality of the job, but on some days, it really hits home. And one more thing today, uh, today is uh, Tim Hortons Day. Uh, you could uh, get your Tim Hortons down in the steam line and they'll be uh, by donation. Happy Father's Day, Calgary. We really do miss the kinds of things that uh, you would have at home, normal life, uh, you know, Christmas, birthdays, uh, Easter, Mother's Day, Father's Day, and whenever we have a, a celebration like this, we'd like to, to, you know, raise the profile of the event on board and make sure that we acknowledge the people who are fathers. Uh, we do the same thing for Mother's Day or, or any other event like that. Today is Father's Day, um, and I have 65 fathers on board, and I have the gambit. I have one grandfather, and I have one father who is just barely a week. And it's, it's a difficult time. For us right now, Calgary is a family, is the way I would describe it. 237 people, uh, 12 time zones away from our family, and uh, currently deployed on an operation. Of all the factors that can influence the success or failure of this mission, one of the most important is the morale of the ship's company. Holidays like Father's Day, when treated respectfully for sailors thousands of miles from home, become noteworthy ship events. A special breakfast marking the significance of the day goes a long way in recognizing the fathers and the crew separated from their families. There's milestones that you miss uh, all the time while in the Navy. Some people deal with it differently. Uh, most people, however, fully understand just the nature of what we do. Uh, being away from home, being away from our families, being away from our children. Uh, it is harder at times. Uh, most people, it seems though, uh, have a good uh, 
group of people that they can always talk to if they are having difficulties dealing with certain situations, whether it be birthdays or a day like today, it's Father's Day. And we do have three brand new fathers on board that have had children since we sailed. Or GT, sir? PDEs. This Father's Day is particularly unique for ordinary seaman Darren Paul Agius, a new father who's yet to meet his firstborn. Well, I'm a new father, and my son's uh, name is Nicholas. Just newborn. He was born on just uh, just six days ago, and he's eight pounds, two ounces. So far, everybody's seen photos of my kid, but uh, <laughs> but me. Every single minute of every day, like there's not a moment that I'm not thinking of them. And sometimes it gets pretty stressful, but I'm able to uh, to handle it and deal with it in a positive manner. Missing the special events that bring families together is a personal sacrifice that cuts across every Navy rank. Some flexibility is sometimes possible, however. For leading seaman Mark Lavoie, his role as a technician in a large department combined with a well-timed port visit gave him the opportunity to fly home for the birth of his second child. I spent three good days with my uh, my son. My other son as well, Maxim, who's uh, two years now, so it was a beautiful time. And Met the ship in Croatia. Got a, it was the hardest thing I ever did in my life. This is a beautiful picture of my wife, Krista, and my son, Gabriel. Just received it a couple of weeks ago. My wife sent it there on the, uh, on the email. So once I just put it right on top of my, uh, my bed there. So before I go, go to, go to bed, I have a look. This is my oldest son, Maxim. And Gabriel holding his little brother. Can't wait to be home. And, spend more time with them, but I need to be here too, so I gotta do my job and that's it. Your mindset's gotta be, you know, switch on. You gotta, you gotta do a job and hopefully those six months gonna go fast. For Master Corporal Dean March, being one of only two helicopter technicians in HMCS Calgary's air detachment, meant he missed the birth of his second child. About four days ago, I had a little baby girl, Alyssa, uh, eight pounds, uh, one ounce, a big girl. Uh, my wife delivered her at the Victoria General Hospital back in Victoria, BC. Um, she's a very beautiful little girl. I've seen a, a picture on the internet, but uh, no big pictures yet. So uh, it's very hard. Um, I must say I would rather be home than be on this deployment, but we have a job to do here. Um, it requires me to be here. Um, I'm one of uh, two people on board that can do the job that I do, so it's not like I can opt out of the deployment like a lot of other trades on board the ship. On Father's Day, it's hard, especially now that I have a new daughter. Um, but it's like any other holiday. You're, you're out here on a warship instead of being home and enjoying the holidays. So uh, it's like any other. Maybe especially difficult because I have a new daughter, four days old, but uh, we'll get through it. We've gone through some difficult times over the last year and a half. Uh, leading up to this point, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm always impressed by the resilience and uh, enthusiasm, uh, the, the team focus. Uh, it's it's great. It uh, it's a challenge for guys like me who are in the leadership position to stay out in front of them. But uh, now a great bunch of people. Calgary's XO and father of two brings a unique global perspective to this special day. We don't wear a blue beret anymore, but we're out here now. Um, still, I would say, in a sense, uh, keeping the peace. Uh, I have two daughters, and I would much rather be with them. Um, but I know that what I do is important, and I hope that what I am doing, and just with all the other fathers here, say will make some small difference in some small way, so that when they grow up, maybe, maybe, life will be a little bit better for them. But I'm no different than any other father, even in this region here. And that's what I try to tell the sailors on board here. They're fathers too. And they're trying to do what we're trying to do, and that's provide a better life for their children. Whether they're bringing maritime security to one of the most lawless regions of the world and leaving families thousands of miles behind to do so, or trying to eke out a living in one of the most impoverished areas of the planet, Understanding the shared connection of fatherhood brings a deeper level of tolerance to this war-torn area. 
regardless of what festive occasion, what holy day, or whose birthday it may be. Calgary and her crew continue with their tasks round the clock until it's time to come home. That's the day that really matters out here. The last one.